Hi, good evening. My name is Perry Brown. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, and just let me welcome you to the final uh, lecture of the Provost Distinguished Faculty Lectures for this fall. We've had three really great lectures already, and I expect another one tonight. And the thing that's on the screen, I think, should entertain us just by itself a little bit. So when he explains some of that that's going on, I think it'll be great. Um, so we'll have another series next fall, as we, we do every fall. Uh, we have the opportunity in these lectures to honor some of the UM faculty members that have received national and international awards in the last year. And as many of you can suspect, uh, when you receive national awards, you get a lot of acclaim outside of Missoula. And sometimes on campus, your colleagues and your students and your friends don't know what you got an award for. And so we like to honor the people right here and let you share in some of their experience and some of their ideas so that you know what they are award winners for as well. So with that, I'm going to get off the stage. I'm going to ask uh, Dean Denise Dowling, the Dean of the School of Journalism, to introduce our speaker for tonight. Denise? Thank you, Perry. Thanks, all of you, for coming out in the chilly weather. I know it must have been cold to uh, come out of your dorm rooms and your homes when it's, I don't know what the temperature is, but it's brisk out there. It has been my privilege to work with Ray Fanning for the last six, six and a half, six and a half, seven, seven, seven years now. Um, Ray came to us after a long career in television news. He worked at TV stations all around the West, including North Dakota, Idaho, Utah, and ultimately KGW Television in Portland, Oregon, where he was the special projects producer. Ray took his first teaching job at Columbia College in Chicago and taught there for several, several years before he joined our faculty in 2007. Now, Ray's background is in television news, but he saw when he came to us, and even before, that the world of journalism was changing. And you can all see that, and you've seen that. Uh, journalism looks a lot different today than it did even 10 years ago. With the advent of 24-hour news channels and the rise of the internet and social media, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got mobile apps, we've got lots and lots of different ways to get our news now. Um, in that change, we lost some of our gatekeepers, editors, producers, the people who normally vetted the news that uh, started to go away as organizations and people took their information directly to you, the audience. So um, there has definitely been more emphasis placed on the consumer's role in news and Ray made himself an expert in the area of news literacy. So he has attended um, seminars and training sessions and he designed the University of Montana's first ever news literacy course that we offered for the first time two years ago. And when Ray designed that, it was one of the very first courses chosen for the Global Leadership Initiative here at UM. So we'll be offering it again this spring, and that'll be the third time. Ray constantly keeps this course updated because the world of news and journalism is changing so rapidly, and we're just thrilled that he gets to, sh he will share some of this with us tonight so that we can become better news consumers. It is my privilege to introduce his talk tonight on news literacy, truth versus truthiness. This is Professor Ray Fanning. Thanks, Denise. Uh and thank you, Perry, for the opportunity. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, also thanks to uh, Claudine and uh, Sky and the Provost's office for sort of arranging everything. Um, how many of you are here from J100? A few, good, excellent. GLI students? OK, yeah, this was this uh, class I taught in the first GLI, as uh, Denise mentioned. What we have on the screen here at the moment is two, uh, two ways to get to uh, a decision. 
We have the well-reasoned analysis. As you can see, you weigh the evidence, you examine the sources, you discard bad info, you research claims, and then you find out that you were right all along, which is also the shortcut to get there. So we're going to be talking about how we evaluate information, uh, and particularly as it pertains to uh, our duties as citizens to, uh, to vote. Let's see if that works. OK, so truth. We're going to talk about truth. We're going to talk about truthiness. So truth is the journalist's first obligation, to tell the truth. Should be pretty simple, right? You find the truth, you tell the truth. But sometimes that's not so easy, particularly when you're competing with truthiness, all right? So truthiness, truth and truthiness. And the, a lot of the, the history of the world is being able to tell the difference between them. Truthiness is a fairly uh, modern term for this. But uh, Samuel Clemens, which you uh, know as Mark Twain, uh, had this to say about the, uh, the printing press, that truth and truthiness have always been uh, fighting against each other. He said that, it, he found the, uh, that the printing press found truth a stir on earth and gave it wings, but untruth was abroad, and it was supplied with a double pair of wings. So untruth tends to spread faster than truth sometimes. Again, what we're going to be kind of looking at tonight. So, truthiness. Where did we get this word? Well, we have to thank uh, Stephen Colbert for this. Uh, he uh, used this in his first program, which was back in uh, 2005. It became Webster's Word of the Year for 2006. And uh, the American Dialect Society there kind of defines it. The quality of stating concepts or facts one wishes or believes to be true rather than concepts or, and facts known to be true. So let's, uh, let's hear it. So there's truth, there's truthiness. They're in this uh, lifelong battle against each other. And news literacy is here, we hope, to, uh, to fight against truthiness. So for our purposes tonight, let's say that news literacy is the ability to use critical thinking skills to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports, whether they come via print, television, or the internet. And I will make a confession, my background is in television, as Denise said, so most of the examples we're going to get tonight are television. I apologize to those who don't like television or prefer other examples, but that's my background. So that's, uh, that's what you're going to get tonight. So how do we know what's reliable? Who's this? Sarah Palin. Is it Sarah Palin? OK, so this, this picture circulated. Uh, when Sarah Palin was still governor of Alaska, but she had been asked to, or she'd been chosen to be the vice presidential nominee. So this picture circulated uh, to basically discredit her with voters. But is it true? Not true, okay? Photoshopped, so that's what we're up against. Uh, we're gonna be talking a lot about the information age tonight, but Photoshopping and uh, the internet allow you to do a lot of things that uh, help supply truthiness with, uh, with what it uses. So not so true there. Uh, if you Google uh, Martin Luther King Jr., well, at least the last time I tried doing this, uh, Google will come up at fifth or sixth maybe in your, in your listings. You'll get this website. Looks pretty good. You start looking around a little bit. You notice down at the bottom here there's kind of some weird stuff going on there. So, Let's take a closer look at who's behind this website. Let's enlarge that for you. So we see Join MLK Discussion Forum hosted by Stormfront. Who's Stormfront? Well, so let's go there. So who's hosting this uh, website on Martin Luther King? Looks like a uh, white supremacist organization to me. So that's fine. First Amendment says they can, they can have a web page, they can promote their ideas. But if you're a news consumer and you're looking for usable information about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is this the website you want to be on? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. So again, that's what's going on out there. Then there's this. <laughs> Also, on the plane crash, KTV has just learned the names of the four pilots who were on board the flight. They are Captain Sung Ting Wong, Wee Too Low, 
Hold me Fook and Bang Ding Ow. And the NTSB has confirmed these are the names of the pilots on board flight 214 when it crashed. We are working to determine exactly what roles each of them played during the landing on Saturday. Really? Really? Did someone look at that and then put it on television? They were right at what they said at the end. The National Transportation Safety Board did confirm those names. But does that let the television station off the hook? No one looked at that, really? I mean, even if it was confirmed by the NTSB, I look at that, I'm not going to put it on the air, right? There it is again. Uh, we hope. But for some reason, the, the, the filters, the fact-checking, the gatekeepers, as Denise referred to, were asleep, or they were just so happy to have this scoop that they thought nobody else had that that gets on television. And so, truth or truthiness? So the problem is there's a lot of misinformation out there. But we, as humans, have an appetite for information. Metaphorically, I would say it's almost in our DNA. And here are some of the things that we are looking for. We want information that alerts us. We want information that diverts us. And we want information that connects us to other people. That's sort of hardwired into us. Even, you know, anthropologists look at uh, civilizations, no matter how primitive, there was always this way to exchange information, to exchange news. So we're sort of stuck with that. We, we want it to happen. So alerts, you know, if you're in San Francisco and uh, the governor declares San Francisco area a disaster area because of wildfires, you probably want to be alerted to that. Maybe if you're on the East Coast, you want to know about Superstorm Sandy so that you can avoid, uh, you know, avoid the storm if possible. So those are the kind of alert information I'm talking about. Diverts, you know, what's Miley Cyrus doing today? Have you seen Gravity? Uh, who's the sexiest man alive? What are Kim and Kanye up to for the weekend? We want to know that, you know. There, you hear a lot of talk about uh, entertainment news, but, you know, that's stuff that we want to know about. So that, that's information that diverts us. And then we have a hunger for information that connects us. So usually this kind of brings a national experience together. So the people recovering from Superstorm Sandy, hearing about them, sort of connects us with them. The uh, survivors and uh, others with the uh, marathon bombing in Boston. Or maybe sharing the joy of the uh, little kid with leukemia who gets to save San Francisco as Bat Kid. That's the sort of stuff that pulls us together. Maybe if, you know, uh, a huge majority of people watch the Super Bowl. That's something we're all doing together at once, and that, that connects us. But we also need actionable information because we're citizens and because we're tasked with voting and making decisions. So that's a whole different kind of information. But that's crucial to us if we're going to function as, uh, as active citizens and to participate in, in the government. So that's a different kind of information. That's all based on and comes from the First Amendment. So here it is. I think it's 39 or 37 words. But uh, freedom of the press is one of the five freedoms that you pull out of the, uh, the First Amendment. So the question is, or, or what I should say, the, the Founding Fathers seemed to indicate that they thought that the freedom of the press was inherently important to self-government. If we're going to govern ourselves, we need to be informed. And the press is, is uh, the way that we're going to do that. Uh, James Madison put it this way, English common law allowed suppression of the press, but in America, the people, not the government, possess the absolute sovereignty. So that means we're in charge. That's what the First Amendment says. And I would argue that the, uh, the First Amendment is the freedom of the press is not uh, only for the institutional press, the working press. I would argue that this is a freedom that we all have as citizens and that the institutional press are the people who do it as a job. And, but they're doing it for us. But I think that the First Amendment empowers all of us to be, as the uh, figure on the left is there, the watchdog, the watchdog of government. We've got to keep an eye on it, and that's one of the essential reasons for, for the press. So in the information age, 
there's a challenge for all of us uh, in determining what's reliable and what's not. We're all in charge of that. We, we have to be responsible for ourselves for reasons that I'll get to later. But it's just this explosion of information that has made it impossible to, you know, to go to other people and, and get all that information. You sort of have to decide for yourself what you're going to pick and choose and what you're going to take to heart. So three things I want to talk about as we move along here. These are uh, problems, challenges for uh, the news consumer, which we all are. The lines are getting blurred. Now, uh, businesses that run the media have found that there are business models that if you discard sort of the traditional uh, objectivity and fairness and balance, you can make money. So we have all sorts of different information out there, and it's hard to keep them straight. So we'll try to talk about blurring the lines a little bit. There's information overload. The internet, uh, cell phones, social media, we get so much information coming at us at once that it's difficult to take it all in and, and sort of filter it and decide what we should use and what we shouldn't. And then, overcoming your own bias. Yes, yes, all of you, you're to blame. And I will tell you why later on. But we all have our own biases, and, and we need to sort of do an inventory of that and see how that's affecting the news we consume and the news that we use. So two watershed moments I want to talk about, because I'm going to mostly, again, talk about television. I'm sorry if you don't like television, but here it goes. 60 Minutes went on the air in about 1968. Not a huge success at first. Took a while to build up some momentum. But by 1976, I think I said yes, 1976, it was the number one program on television. This was great for 60 Minutes. This was bad for news consumers. And I'll tell you why. Because suddenly the suits who run the media companies said, hey, wait a minute. We can make money from news. We've never thought about that before. News is just something we had to do to keep our licenses. We had to broadcast in the, uh, in the public interest. But wait a second, this program's making, making money. So that's going to be important to us down the road. Uh, and it's even better because an hour of news costs much less to produce than an hour of primetime television. Let's do a lot of more news shows, and we'll see how that factors into this a little bit later. Then, CNN, June 1st, 1980. CNN goes on the air. This is also great news. You suddenly have the concept of 24-hour news. We're going to bring you news 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If we have a huge story, it's going to be terrific because we can get you all the information we have and we can make sure you have all of it. But what about on a slow news day? Hmm, we still have 24 hours to fill. Hmm. What are we going to do with that time? So CNN, although CNN is great, sort of led to this concept of 24-hour news and suddenly time to fill. So that's where we started to get the, sort of the creep of entertainment news. It's sort of where we started to see opinion coming into play rather than, than fact-based news. So I just wanted to keep those two things in mind as we go forward because they were sort of fundamental changes in the way news was handled. So the lines are getting blurred. Who's a journalist? Is Oprah a journalist? Yes, Oprah's a journalist. Nobody thinks Oprah's a journalist. OK. What about Bill O'Reilly? Is he a journalist? We're not sure. We don't know, yes. Or is that just a head scratch? OK. What about Jon Stewart? Is he a journalist? Ooh, hands are coming up for Jon Stewart. It's tough to tell anymore. Jon Stewart gets asked this question all the time, and his answer is that he's not a journalist, but if anything, he comes close to being an editorial cartoonist. So that he takes the news and puts a satirical spin on it. But it's hard to tell what's going on out there. I mean, is it news? Is it propaganda? Is it uh, opinion? Is it politics? Is it entertainment? They all sort of mix together. And it's hard for the news consumer to decide what is what. So the tension can build in the newsroom. This is Mika Brzezinski. 
She is the co-anchor of Morning Joe on MSNBC. Uh, this is a little clip that has to do with the difference between entertainment news and what she considers real news. She's been chatting with her on-air co-hosts. They've been talking about the president's war strategy. This was a few years ago. And then she looks down and she sees that her next story is Paris Hilton getting out of jail. Well, you'd think we'd be leading with that story. No, I, I, I want to lead with uh, the Paris Hilton no, story. No, and you know what? Like, my producer, Andy Jones, is not listening to me. He's put it as the lead. He has a lighter commitment. On TV. On TV. It's a Paris Hilton story, okay? Hold on a second. I'm going to make a point. We're not covering this, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm done with the Paris Hilton story. Okay, I have a line. Uh, I won't do it. Will you burn this for me, please? I will not. I'll cherish it all. It's... Oh, 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 Smell. <laughs> Even smells good. I'm about to snap. You get to see that. And then we, of course, have Paris Hilton. Right. That's why. Um, I ripped up the previous no. Paris story. They're right. leading with it again. Where are you going? I'm shredding. Symbolic gesture. Symbolic number three. gesture number three. This is my Paris Hilton and story. And we're going to What a statement. That is a statement about the state. Bye-bye. Well, you know, you're going to change the world. Yeah. 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 At least my world. Yeah. I'm, not doing, I'm not doing the story. By the way. She's not doing the story. So is Paris Hilton getting out of jail news? OK. Is it more important news than the president's war strategy? OK. But you, you know, you get, you get a mix. Uh, but there was, that was uh, a time when she felt that the tension was too much. And she said, I'm not doing it. We have all sorts of information out there. So how do we, how do we get around it and, and decide what's usable to us? Well, one of the things you can do is try to identify the news neighborhood that you're in when you're, when you're taking in information. So different sorts of news neighborhoods. You probably can't read this very well. But um, across the top, we have journalism, entertainment, advertising, publicity, propaganda, and raw information. So the idea here is if you can identify the news neighborhood you're in, that will help you decide how to use that information. So journalism, goal to inform entertainment to amuse, advertising to sell, uh, publicity to promote, propaganda to build mass support. And raw information is sort of to bypass the filters. And you think of Julian Assange just releasing you know, a ton of information. Uh, so if you can sort of figure out what neighborhood you're in, that'll help you evaluate that information and how to use it down the road. And so what's different with journalism? Well. The things that you should look for if, you're in, if you think you're in the journalism neighborhood are these three things, verification, independence, and accountability. So verification is what? Making sure it's true. Making sure it's true. Actually, we're back to truth. We're going to find the truth. And, but verification is, is proving that it's true, having evidence to back it up. I mean, I can stand up here and say anything. And if I don't offer any evidence to back it up, I'm not verifying the information. So you have to look for information. It's documents, it's photographs, it's recordings, it's papers, it's whatever backs up what, what you're hearing. Independence means that the uh, journalists are working for you. They're not working for the advertisers. They're not working for the political parties. They're not working for special interest groups. They're working for you, and that you are their main uh, focus and client here. Accountability means you know, I'm telling you who I am. I'm standing behind the report. I'm giving you ways to contact me if you have questions. Uh, I'm, I'm open and willing to listen to your, criti your critiques of, of the work and, and your questions and comments. So if you get all three of those together, they sort of meld in together, and you get that sweet spot in the middle that's journalism. If, it, if you don't get all three of those, even though it may be labeled journalism, it really isn't journalism. So that's what you want to look for when you're in the, uh, in the journalism neighborhood. So there are, there's a recent story here that gives us a really good way of looking at uh, verifying information, independence, and accountability. So did anyone see this 60-minute Benghazi report? OK, you did. All right, so here this was Scott Pelley uh, the day of the uh, broadcast. 
doing a promo for it. And basically they're saying, okay, tonight you're gonna hear for the first time from a security officer who was inside the US uh, embassy in Benghazi, Libya. And as, as you remember, that's the, uh, the embassy that was attacked and the, uh, the ambassador was killed, other people were injured. Uh, so, up at the top you notice the red flag and the yellow flag. Sort of stolen this from racing. The red flag, if the red, red flag gets ra waved, mm -hmm. uh, what's the problem? It's a crash, it's a disaster, something's wrong, everybody needs to stop. Okay, the yellow flag means what? Slow down, caution, you know, there could be problems here. So there probably weren't any red flags with this story, but as we go through, I think you'll see that there were some, uh, some yellow flags. So here's uh, Laura Logan, she was the uh, reporter on this story. And the first thing that she tells us in this report is that events surrounding uh, this report have been overshadowed by misinformation, confusion, intense partisanship. In other words, this was a huge political football that people were making hay up about. Both sides trying to use it against the other side. You know, did the M M ask for help and not get it, et cetera, et cetera. So right off the bat, we know that there's, there are people trying to control, you know, the information about this and using it in, in, in a way that benefits them. So that's a yellow flag that you've got a problem that's probably, or a story that's probably going to be hard to verify. So, here's this guy. Uh, for purposes of the report, uh, he was called Morgan Jones, not his real name. His story was that he worked for a security, a private security firm in uh, Libya, and that he had gone into the embassy and was there during the attack. And that was sort of the premise for this whole story. Uh, he was using a pseudonym, Morgan Jones, because he said he needed to be, he, his safety, his identity needed to be protected, although he went on camera, so, you know, you could decide how much of a, of a protection that was. But he claimed he was there. He was there when the attack went on, and here's a little piece of the, his interview with uh, Lara Logan. Not long afterwards, Morgan Jones scaled the 12-foot-high wall of the compound that was still overrun with Al-Qaeda fighters. One guy saw me. He, he just shouted. I couldn't believe that he'd seen me because it was so dark. Uh, he started walking towards me. And as he was coming closer? As I got closer, I just hit him with the butt of the rifle in the face. And? Oh, he went down. He dropped? Yeah, like a stone. With his face smashed in? Mm, yeah. And no one saw you do it? No. Or heard it? No, there was too much noise. Okay, so no one saw you do it, no one heard you. Is there any verification here of what he says? No. So, yellow flag, no verification. Yellow flag, uh, accountability. He's not using his, his real name. All right, so what we find out after the report is, well, actually, let me do this next part first. Later in the report, we find out, ah, he has a book. He's written a book about this. And so, uh, how, how does that raise a yellow flag for us? Money, okay, so he's, he has a stake, he has an interest in promoting this book that's about to go on sale. So, does he have uh, a motivation to maybe juice the information a little bit to get the sales going? Yeah, I would say he does. I'd say he got another yellow flag there, right? Here, okay, CBS is having a bad day. Let's make the day worse. It's gonna get worse. Who's publishing this book? Simon & Schuster. Who owns Simon & Schuster? CBS. So even if there wasn't any collusion going on, it certainly looks like CBS has a, a stake in putting this guy on the air who may or may not be able to verify what he's doing to sell the book. So after the report, a lot of information comes out about him. First, we find out his name is really Dylan Davies. Second, he told his employer that he wasn't at the compound, although he said he lied to the employer because they told him not to go there. But he also told the FBI that he wasn't at the compound. So now he's told two different stories around and about. So CBS hears this back, plus then the State Department says, 
he wasn't there. So what happens to poor Laura Logan? She has to apologize. Okay, so here's the, the end of her apology for the uh, Benghazi report. On Thursday night, when we discovered the account he gave the FBI was different than what he told us, we realized we had been misled, and it was a mistake to include him in our report. For that, we are very sorry. The most important thing to every person at 60 Minutes is the truth, and the truth is, we made a mistake. I'm Laura Logan. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. Okay, so again, the truth is the most important thing. And you could give CBS, and in fact, I probably will give CBS points here for accountability in our, v, our verification independence accountability. They did stand up, or sit down, and, and apologize uh, that they had done something wrong. But they took a whole lot of heat from other uh, news organizations because they didn't really explain how it happened. So they were a little bit transparent, but not really transparent enough. So you can sort of see how, how uh, verification independence and accountability can kind of get you into trouble if you, if you ignore it. Uh, Lara Logan uh, and the producer of that piece are on indefinite leave from uh, 60 Minutes. So we don't know how, what that will mean down the road. Okay, so blurring the lines and uh, verification independence and accountability. Let's go on to our second challenge here, overload. So we have two communication revolutions here. We have Gutenberg, and what did he do? Printing press, movable type, books suddenly getting to the masses, information spreading easily. What did Mark Zuckerberg do? Facebook. Okay, so he's the representation of of the internet revolution. Um, basically, things have changed so fast. They changed quickly with the, with the printing press, but they changed even faster with the internet revolution. So it's hard to believe, but between the end of George W. Bush's first term, at the end, at the end of George W. Bush's first term, there was no Facebook, there was no YouTube, there was no Twitter. Didn't exist. By the time uh, President Obama was elected, all three of those things existed, and his campaign had used social media to help him get elected. So you, you just sort of get the sense of the rapid change that we're undergoing here, and the huge tsunami of information that's out there. So this is uh, from the uh, Global Information Industry Center at the University of California, San Diego, but they estimate that we're exposed to about 100,000 words a day from different, from different places, uh, from television, radio, phone, print, computer, computer games, movies, recorded music. They also estimate that we spend up to, or close to five hours a day with television, a couple hours with radio, almost an hour on the phone, uh, a little more than half an hour with print, almost two hours on the computer. So all this information is coming into us, makes it tough to be a, to be a news consumer. Social media also dumps uh, an estimated 54,000 words on us, uh, you know, and links to so 443 minutes of video a day. You know, some people must get more than others. But that's, uh, that's the estimate of, uh, of uh, Lifehack, uh, which is an online magazine. But the point I'm trying to make here is we've got a lot of stuff coming at us. A lot of information to sort through to find the difference between truth and truthiness. But we need to do it because an informed electorate is critical to a functioning democracy. If we don't know what's going on, we're going to be in trouble. And the problem is we're not always so well informed. Researchers from the University of Maryland did a survey at the uh, midterm elections of 2010, and they asked a bunch of questions to people as they were headed to the polls. They didn't get all that many correct answers. All right, so I want you to take yourself back to 2010. I want you to think about if you had been asked this question then, since January 2009, have your federal income taxes gone down? Stay the same? A little timid hand. Gone up. And mostly of you are non-voters. I said you had to participate in our democracy here. <laughs> okay, all right, you weren't, you weren't able to vote then. Is that what you're telling me? All right, I guess I'll, I'll let you go. I'm not going to tell you the answer yet, but I will tell you that 
86% of the people who answered that question got it wrong. Another question, do you think that most scientists believe that climate change is occurring? Views are evenly divided between scientists or climate change is not occurring? I'm not going to make you vote because you didn't do very well the last time. But 45% of people got that question wrong when they were asked. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about the answers here. According to the, uh, the Federal Budget Office, or excuse me, the Congressional Budget Office, taxes, federal income taxes had gone down since, uh, the, uh, since President Obama went into office. On the terms of climate change, the National Institute of Sciences, which contains lots of scientists, and that's the uh, question we were asking, what do scientists think, had overwhelmingly uh, voted that, that climate change was happening and action need to be, needed to be taken. So people got those questions wrong. Survey also asked people, where do you get your news? And this is where it gets a little bit interesting. Another question. During the election campaign, some people said that the US Chamber of Commerce was spending large amounts of money it had raised from foreign sources to support Republican candidates and attack Democratic candidates. Is it your impression that this was not proven true? 60% said that, which was correct. It was not proven true. Or it was proven true. 31% got it wrong. So now let's look at where they got most of their news. The folks who got it wrong identified themselves as, you can't see that very well, but as almost every day watching MSNBC or uh, NPR and PBS. So that's where they said they got that information. So is there bias going on in the, in the uh, news organizations or is something else at work here? Let's look at the climate change question. This time, 45% got it wrong. The majority of the people who got it wrong watched Fox News almost every day. So is there a correlation there or not? Well, let's just keep that in mind as we move along here. But what this brings us up to is Moynihan's maxim. Everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. You gotta come to some agreement on facts and, and what the truth is. So, do we have media bias going on here, or do we have audience bias? Media bias would be uh, a consistent uh, series of unfair, unbalanced stories that would mislead the, uh, mislead the electorate, and that's certainly what some political activists say is going on. Audience bias would be, uh, I, just, I just don't hear anything that I don't agree with. If I don't agree with it, I don't hear it, I don't seek it out. So, so which is it? Well, the latest poll that Pew did uh, on partisan uh, bias in, in the media shows that the, the public does see a, uh, a significant bias going on here. 74% say that the uh, news media tends to favor one side or the other. 50% uh, believe the media has a liberal slant, 22% that it has a conservative slant. But hold on a second. We've got cognitive dissonance here. Anybody know what this is? What is it? It's where you convince yourself of something. Okay, so uh, neuro researchers and social science researchers uh, are finding that hu uh, there's a human trait that blocks out information that you don't agree with and tends to drive you toward information that you don't agree with. So this is where I said earlier that we may be to blame for our own problems here with truth and truthiness. So the, uh, the news literacy recommendation for this is that if you eat a, eat, eat a constant diet of Rachel Maddow, you know, try some uh, tasty uh, stuff from the other side, some Bill O'Reilly. If you uh, watch Fox News every day, you know, give MSNBC a chance. If you, watch, if you read the New York Times, you know, try the Wall Street Journal. The idea here is that if, if we are suffering from cognitive dissonance, we should, broaden, we should broaden our news diet so that we take in some of this information. All right, so I know I'm, I'm running low on time and I'm running. All right, so quickly, I'm gonna kind of try to move through this. We've talked about verified, independent, and accountable, that you should be looking for that in your news reports. Now we're gonna talk about the people that are interviewed in news stories, because these are, these are people that you want to look at carefully as well. I'm vain. 
That's going to be a mnemonic for, for the uh, choices I'm bringing up here. The question says who is important. Who is the information coming from? Who are the journalists going to to get that information? So here are the things that you want to look at. Remember, independent sources are better than self-interested sources. I'll explain that a little more in a minute. Multiple sources are better than single sources. Sources who verify are better than sources who assert. Authoritative informed sources are better than uninformed sources. And named sources are better than unnamed sources. So I'm going to pick Mr. Davies again here for a while. So independent sources are better than self-interested sources. We've already sort of determined that he was a self-interested source. He had a book to sell. So if you see that in evaluating a, a news report, you see a self-interested source, you've got to put that in the back of your mind. That doesn't necessarily disqualify them from, from being a source. But it, if, if things add up against them, you might want to uh, dis, you know, uh, discount them as, as a source. So you want independent sources, not people that are self-interested in the story somehow. Multiple sources are better than single sources. Again, we've got Mr. Davies here. He was the only one that they were hanging that story on. There was no corroboration. There was no other people that saw him there. There was no one else to back him up. He was a single source. Again, not disqualifying him completely, but it would be better if there were other people telling the same story. Sources who verify are better than sources who assert. What, what does it mean to assert? They verify so it doesn't really up. Right, I, just, I can say anything. I can say the, the earth is flat. I can assert that, but if I don't have any evidence to back it up, what good is it? So if the sources you see in a story are just asserting things, you know, you might want to consider them not such a great source. Authoritative or informed sources are better than uninformed. Uh, he was in Libya, so we will give him a little bit of a doubt, therefore, that he might be informed. I, he wasn't at the location, so I wouldn't say he's authoritative. He wasn't an expert on that. But you want to evaluate the sources and, and decide, are, they, are these people that, I, that the reporter should be talking to for this story or not? Do they make sense to be in the story? Now, I could have kept Mr. Davies here again, uh, because he did go under a false name, but I thought I'd give him a break here, finally. Named sources are better than unnamed sources. When you see somebody in silhouette, when we don't know their name, when we can't verify who they are, how does that make you feel about that person as a source? Makes them a weaker source, I would, I would think. You know? So it's much better when someone stands up and says, I'm Joe Schmo, and this is what I saw. That's much better. I know who the information is coming from. If I'm in a silhouette and my voice is being altered because I'm not willing to, to come forward for some reason, I'm going to doubt that source a little bit. So when you deal with uh, unnamed sources, you want to look for transparency from the reporter. Is the reporter telling you why this person is unnamed? Are they giving you a good reason that, you know, to protect their life or whatever? Are they giving you some validation for choosing to keep that source anonymous? You want to look for characterization. Is this source important? Is this a, you know, a high, high source in the Obama administration? Is it a co-worker of the man who was killed? You want to understand what the relationship is. And you want to look for corroboration in, in from other people of what this person is saying. You know, can, they, can the reporter back up the information you know, from other sources besides this one? So that's, that's what you want to, uh, want to look for. And I'm really long here, so we're going to skip this. I was going to have you look at some sources, but I'm going to skip that. No, you can't watch that. Uh, and you can't look at this either because I've just talked too long. But I want to leave you with a couple of things. News literacy is hard work. It's not easy. You know, it used to be that the... The newspaper came out in the morning. You could listen to the radio newscasts on the hour. You could watch the, the local news or the, or the network news in the afternoon. It was scheduled. You know, where to get, you know where to get it. Now this tsunami of, of information is making it tough for us. So it's hard work to sift through this stuff. But I would say you're not going to have time to do this with every news story you, you see. But if it's important to you, if you have to make an important decision, if you have to vote, uh, that, you, that these tools will help you out and, and try to decide whether something is truth 
or truthiness. And I just want to end with this map. I sort of get depressed every time I look at this map, but I think it also helps us understand our perspective in the world. This is the press freedom map. And so this is published every year. And countries sort of rise and fall on this from year to year. But uh, the, the countries in white have the, the best press freedom. Satisfactory is yellow. Noticeable problems, orange. Difficult situations, red. Black is, is a very serious uh, situation. So you can see that the white and, and yellow are a little bit outnumbered by the orange, black, and the red. And that's kind of the world we live in. The, uh, anyone know who the, what the number one? number one country is on the, for press freedom? No? Finland. Finland, we're number one. Who's, the, who's at the bottom of the list? Exactly right. North Korea is at the bottom of the list. Where does the US rank? Look, there's a lot of white up there. White is, white is considered freer than we are. The US is 32nd this year. Last year, we were 47th because of the, uh, the crackdown on the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement included arresting journalists. So we dropped down like 15 points and now we're sort of back up to, to where we normally are. But look at this, cherish the, uh, the press freedom that we have here and the, and the freedom we have to, uh, to decide our own fate uh, by voting and, and you know, be informed and, and vote. Thanks. Great, yeah. My question is, if a journalist is working for a news agency, are they still considered independent? Well, yeah. I mean, the independence is looking at, at how they're reporting. I mean, if, if, you were, um, if you were doing a story that, that on car safety and you were sort of going out of your way to favor General Motors, that would be not being independent. By working for a, for a station or a or paper or that doesn't make you not independent, as long as the paper is uh, working for, the, uh, the, for all of us and not for special interests. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Anybody else? Oh, everyone's so cold. Ray, um, did you see this business with the uh, Twitter from the airplane that happened over Thanksgiving? Um, it was... It was somebody who was telling a story on Twitter about a problem that they had on an airplane. And this person was supposedly a journalist. Um, and BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, all of these people picked up on it re as aggregators, you know, sent, sent this information out. Turns out that it was all made up. And I wonder um, what you see with aggregators and what their responsibility is in verifying this other information that they're putting out there. Well, I, I think we, we should hope that there was some fact checking going on, but I don't think there is in a lot of cases. I mean, there are sites that are curated that, that people you know, act as gatekeepers for, for, but I mean, you just look at the, the names that got on the Oakland television station. You know, um, hoaxes do end up on, in newspapers, do end up on television, and I think, I think the number of, of employees at, at papers and, and television stations, radio stations dropping means that there are fewer people that are checking a lot of these things. But particularly on the internet, I don't think, I'm not sure that the aggregators feel much of a responsibility to, uh, to fact check. It's just sort of get it, in, get it on, get it out there. If it's wrong, we'll fix it later. Um, it's kind of that mentality of the 24-hour news. And it's even worse with the internet. I mean, it's the 10-minute cycle of getting stuff on. At least that's what I would say. Yeah. Do you foresee like any, I mean, there's already been a drastic decline in print journalism, or print, printed journals in general. And with the it, like, newspapers on the internet, at, you know, the times on the internet mostly consumed in that fashion, do you see like a decline in actual paid journalism jobs? I mean, there already has been, but do you see could there be an advent that would cause there to be no more like paid journalism? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think no more because you've got to have somebody do the work unless everybody's an aggregator. And if everybody's an aggregator, they've got nothing to aggregate. 
but, but I, think, I think the struggle right now is, is how do you monetize it? You know, the internet, when, when newspaper sites went up originally and TV sites and other, you know, other sites, they were free. And so now they're finding it really hard to pull back and ask people to pay, although it's, it's going on more and more. But I still, you still need someone to go out and get the information. Uh, only so many people can sort of coast on grabbing stuff from, from other people. So I think there's still, and I think there's still gonna be a demand for, for journalists in that sense. The delivery system, you know, who knows? Who knows what the delivery system will be in, in 10, 20 years? But you know, it, the, the, the information just doesn't, just doesn't appear. People have to go get it and bring it back. So I don't, I don't think it's the death knell for journalists. Yeah, I, it just looking at some of these things, do you think the demand for a lot of that is down? Well, s sadly, demand is down. I mean, you know, just if you look at uh, you know, research on millennials and, and you know, where they're going for news, it's not the traditional uh, models where we have business models that, that monetize it. So I just think. The, the system hasn't really caught up with where the, where the viewers or the readers, the, the content consumers are. And I think at some point, you know, they're gonna, we're gonna figure that out and that'll be sort of the next, the next leap. You know, maybe it's mobile. I mean, that's what everyone seems to be, you know, hooking their, their sites to now. Anybody else? Well, let's thank, thank Ray again. And